Well, hello guys, welcome back. It's spooky season and I'm back to doing main form videos. So clearly this channel is haunted. Today we're talking about a pretty quick game. I actually played through it in 45 minutes, which is great. That's not entirely true. I actually played through it three times because the first time there was a bug. The second time, well, my file didn't record. So I played through it a third time and I finally got footage and it took me 40 minutes, but it was a blast. And that game is No One Lives Under the Lighthouse. Now, what is No One Lives Under the Lighthouse? It is a small indie horror game with seemingly outdated graphics and a relatively simple story. There's not a lot of dialogue and you, the new lighthouse keeper, have one job. Make sure that there's a light on at night to keep ships off the reef for, well, the next week until you get an assistant. That's the premise. But there's a lot more to the game than that. And we're gonna talk about how such a simple game builds a simple but complex underlying narrative. I'm Huey and this is the Channel Delta, your guide in their vehicle into the world of storytelling. Let's dive in. With No One Lives Under the Lighthouse, the first order of business is gameplay. This isn't a Violet Evergarden situation where I'm not gonna tell you anything about the story or something where I saved the story till the second half like Oprah Din, I'm gonna talk about it. But we're gonna focus on the gameplay first because I want people to get a feel for just how simple this game really is. The premise is incredibly straightforward. There is a lighthouse on an island around a rocky bay. Ships come by. It's your job as the new lighthouse keeper since the previous one disappeared to take oil from the large vats in the storage room up to the top, light the light, crank a knob so that the light will rotate as the thing slowly descends down. It's an interesting system. And just make sure that there's light at night. It's really simple. In fact, you don't get a lot of controls. WASD or WASD to move. E is your interact and you can zoom with left mouse button, like literally zoom in the camera slightly. You also get shift to run and that's about it. The island itself is also very simple. There's a tool shed, your house, which has a couple of rooms, a, like an outhouse, and the lighthouse. That's it. By and large, the game seems very straightforward. There's even moments when the options are even more limited than that. And you can only interact with certain objects at certain times and do certain things. Also, if you've looked at the game, the graphics, the graphics are incredibly dated, intentionally so. I could be wrong, but somehow I think this game came out this year. Maybe it's recent. It's a very recent game. And so a lot of the elements at play here are intentional. The simple outdated graphics that make it hard to see things, the very fundamentally easy systems. It's all straightforward and designed that way. To play through No One Lives Under the Lighthouse, you don't even need to have played any games before. You just need a functioning computer. It's not even a gigabyte of space. It's very quick and it's straightforward. How could a game like that be scary? Especially when it's not on rails. There are actually multiple endings you can choose. We're gonna discuss the first one and I think the most logical one, but I'm gonna leave the other two up for you to decide. But bear in mind for the rest of this video that this is fundamentally a very simple game. And that for our purposes, that's really, really good. Now with the intro to the video out of the way and a short little bit on gameplay done, let's actually discuss the meat of this experience. What's the story and what are the horror elements of No One Lives Under the Lighthouse? The story is relatively straightforward. You, there's kind of a prologue section where you are the previous lighthouse keeper. You take the oil up, you make the lamp work once, and the game fades to black. You get the first cutscene where a new person is rowed to the island, you. You get off, you pick up a briefcase, and you walk to your house. You unpack the contents of the briefcase, get a key, and head up to the lighthouse. Open the door, get oil, crank it, and well, it works. That's day one. At the end of day one, when all that's done, you get a cutscene. Seems innocuous enough, it's just the lighthouse spinning until a boat that was left on the shore for you to get home with 
uh, moves. Something is underneath it and the camera fades out. You can go investigate and sure enough, the next day, the boat has been flipped over. This is day two. Day two, you check this out. It's odd, so you decide to go to the lighthouse, do your job. You get there and you do what is... There are, well, there are three tasks working at the lighthouse, and this is the only day where you do the third one. The first and second tasks are getting oil for the lamp that is the light, and cranking this um, kind of like pendulum clockwork motion thing that allows the light to turn as it pulls down. It's a gear system. You also have to clean the windows off, which you do on the second day. Once you do that, you come back inside to find that the weight that turns the lamp has been cut. The rope is gone and the sandbags are gone. The first day you were here, you didn't really have anything too out of the ordinary. There are some strange sounds that you hear. Something falls past a window that you can't really see, but that's about it. This is the first genuinely scary thing. You go outside and you grab a sandbag and rope from the shed. You go back, you get another sandbag. They're heavy, you can only take one at a time. And on one of the trips, the third trip, the camera fades to black, and suddenly you are no longer your character. In front of you are four insectoid arms reaching out like this, and very far away where you're standing is a couple pixels of you, which then has to sprint. You control yourself, though you can't use your mouse to look. It's a little hard to do, honestly, because it's not super intuitive. You have to sprint to the shed to get shelter. You grab the last bag, go back up, set the lamp back up, now thoroughly, thoroughly rattled, crank it all, turn it on, and as you stand there, the doors lock. You can't interact with them to get either back down or onto the balcony outside the lighthouse, and moths fly all around and coat it, and you hear them. It's like, it's very loud. Then you hear moving below you whatever chased you. You go to bed, and on the third day you wake up, and it's raining. You look around, you don't find anything, you go to the door of the lighthouse, and there on the ground is a picture of a shovel, drawn. You go to the shed, you get the shovel, and you begin digging up the new piles of dirt that have appeared all over the island. When you get to the last pile, you're stopped, and you have another chase scene, this time going the other way, and it's a little harder because this time you're facing the creature, though you can't tell which way you're facing, so you have to turn the character around, then do the run. And you have to make it back to the tool shed, the outhouse, or your house, any will work. You finally dig up the key, finally get the oil canister from the pile the monster was guarding, and then the light doesn't work. So you get more oil, and you do the crank system again. And then you come down the third time when both haven't worked, and the barrels with the fuel for the lamp, they've been taken underground. You have to go into the basement, where no one lives, and sure enough, one rolls out towards you with the rest of the pile. You get your light, you turn on the light, you go to bed. The fourth day, instead of the rain from the third day, you wake up and it's foggy out. Something is walking along your roof. You're stuck in bed through this sequence. It crashes through, we're assuming it's the monster, and you're forced to go to the shed, get the hammer and the nails and the ladder and fix the roof. However, if you did, everything during the sequence, you actually also are now able to open the chest in your room, which gives you a shotgun. You repair everything, you head up, you start the lamp up and do all the sequences so that the lighthouse will work, and as you climb back inside from the lighthouse room, there's the monster standing there. Assuming you have the shotgun and didn't get the fool achievement, you can now shoot the monster and end the game. There are two more endings in case you weren't able to get the shotgun or just elect not to go anywhere with it. And I'm gonna let you find out about those, but we'll talk about what makes this scary in a moment. But that's the background of the world. The game has a drab color palette. The weather effects, especially the rain, combined with the low graphics make it really hard to see sometimes. And that's good, which we'll dive into in a moment. The second major element of the horror is the tarot. For those unfamiliar, tarot is a deck of cards used in a tarot card reading, which is a predictive divination practice done in some cultures. Tarot is similar to a normal card deck. It has minor arcana, uh, which are like playing cards with the addition of an, uh, one more face card to 
each of the suits. I believe it's called a knight. So different versions of a tarot deck might use different ones, meaning that there are 56 minor arcana. There's also 22 major arcana. When I say tara, tarot, sorry, when I say tarot, major arcana are probably what you think of. These are the sun, the tower, the empress, the hierophant, a lot of options here, and they're pretty well known. And interestingly, the game's endings and achievements are all named after major arcana from the tarot deck. In fact, if you get all of them, the large achievement for completing the game is called Major Arcana. You may now rest. Now, I am in no way an expert on tarot. I don't pretend to be, and I didn't have time for this video to get into the meanings of the specific cards or to break down why one action gets you this card. So if that's of interest, I would be happy to do research on that and make another video. It'd be quite a long video, I expect. But for our purposes, tarot is important here because of what it brings in. One, tarot involves a confidence that an outside force is determining which cards come up, and so that the meanings that are brought up on the cards you draw are relevant. This means that fate and destiny are playing a massive role in tarot, and they're playing a massive role in the choices you make. Eventually, if you get a fate, it was predestined. Also, certain choices lead to certain destinies. Tarot's occult and confusing, and so for this to be how the outcomes of the game are determined is very interesting and builds in this layer of uncertain certainty, if you will. You don't know what any one thing does, but you're confident that it has a fixed ending and that it's been planned. The last element is the fact that there's not really a lot of human interaction in the game. The cutscene when the new lighthouse keeper arrives on the island is fine, there's some fancy word dialogue at the bottom of the screen, but by and large there's no conversations, no voices are ever heard, and you never see another person. Instead, the only sounds you get are the strange sounds the monster makes, the moths, the rain, and the music, which starts out on the record player very nice and ends corrupted and scary. The game is isolating you simply by not reminding you of any human contact points. You don't find the bones of the old keeper or anything like that. Rather than go for something traditionally scary, the game relies on the lack of human input to make itself frightening. But does it work? Do all these things in concert, the graphics, the simple gameplay, the tarot, the mystery of it all, the actual events of the story, the... <laughs> Any element of it, does it build into a cohesive horror narrative for such a short, simple game? This is where I do conclusions, and that's exactly what we're going to do for this video. I'd have to say yes. The game works best when it uses its outdated looks and strange soundscape and simple controls to limit what you can do and what you're offered. In a lot of ways, the game was at its best before it ever showed you the monster, when it's truly scary and quiet and frightening. It's a chilling game, but once you see the insect limbs, and eventually once you see the insect at all, it's not really scary anymore. And there's nothing wrong with that per se, but it does take away from it. This is a testament to how loneliness and the unknown work in concert in horror. We've talked about how loneliness can be calming in games like The Long Dark, or stressful in the lore through. And we've talked about how the unknown could be scary in Call of Cthulhu. And this very simple game, at certain points, absolutely nails the combination of the two. Now, to give it more of a gamey feel, there are the chases by the monster, and they're not bad. They're fun sequences, and they're challenging in their own way, limited by the controls and the graphics of the game, but not limited in a scary way. Limited in a, I have to, guess which way my character's moving, I can't use my mouth to move the camera, so I gotta use WASD to turn myself enough, and that's fine, there's nothing wrong with that. It's quite fun, even. But I think the best moments for a game like this come from when its horror plays on that destiny feel, not understanding what's going to happen, when it plays into things most people wouldn't totally grasp, like tarot, or when it explores different themes. However, I would absolutely recommend it. It's only a couple of dollars on Steam, and I had a lot of fun. I think it's a good spooky season playthrough. 
pick it up, give it a shot, and enjoy it. It won't take you very long. Try to 100% it. If you've never platinumed a game before, uh, sorry, PS4 expression. If you've never completed a game before, go for it. This is a great game to do it with. It's fun. Some of the achievements are a little harder to figure out than others. I haven't had a chance to finish all of it, but I've played through enough that I understand it. And I quite like it. Sure, it's not a perfect horror story, uh, but nothing is. Probably the scariest thing is the fact that my hair right here is probably migrated across my face the whole video. But I thought it would be fun to return to this format, to actually talk about a game like this. After all, the things that it does well are clear and simple and easy to understand. The game itself is on a simple premise. It brings in good graphical detail level for what it's doing, meaning below resolution graphics aid it by kind of adding an air of mystery. The soundscape is unbalanced and inhuman, putting you on edge. There's no grounding point, and there's actually no threat, as far as you know, for most of the game. Until you fail chase sequence, you didn't actually know that your character could die. There's no environmental deaths. You can't walk off a cliff or something. All of these in concert set it up to be very scary because you don't know what could actually hurt you in the game. And for that reason, it's actually quite fun. If you want to check out No One Lives Under the Lighthouse, pick it up on Steam, play it at like 3 a.m., you'll have it done by 3.45 and you still get to bed, and you probably won't have nightmares. It's not that scary, but it is fun, and it's a good, it's a good scare. It's not a lasting one. It's not like watching a creepy clown. It doesn't play on jump scares or gore or anything. It's simply just tension, and I really liked it. It's a great example of how a simple game through Doing choices that fit its style can build a tense, scary environment that's fun to, fun to work on, and fun to talk about too. I've actually had fun getting back to writing for this game. I write an outline for all my videos. So thanks so much for watching. Uh, this is coming out after the Dark Souls lore through, but it's filmed before. So you just watched that yesterday on Tuesday, this is coming out on Wednesday, and then on Friday or Saturday, Long Dark Part 4 will be out. Hope you're enjoying those. I've actually gotten a couple spooky season games, so I'm going to try to play another one this week so that I can talk about it next week. Thanks so much for watching. I love having you all. Subscribe, hit the bell, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.